Welcome to today's webinar, Multimorbidity and Acute Kidney Injury. The webinar series is coordinated by the Aging Initiative, which is an NIA-funded initiative that bridges expertise and leadership of two powerhouses for research on multiple chronic conditions. The two powerhouses are the Healthcare Systems Research Network and Claude D. Pepper Older Americans Independent Centers, or Pepper Centers. The initiative is led by Dr. Jerry Gerwitz at University of Massachusetts and Myers Primary Care Institute, along with co Elizabeth Bayless and Jim Magaziner. My name is Heather Whitson. I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine and Ophthalmology at Duke University School of Medicine and the Deputy Director of the Duke Aging Center. And I'm part of the Aging Initiative Dissemination Work Group, co-led by myself at the Pepper Center and Leah Hansen at Health Partners. Before I did, I need to cover a few technical details. Due to the number of registrants for today's webinar, we've placed phone lines on mute to reduce audio feedback. If you're logged in as a host or a panelist, your line is muted. How we welcome and encourage audience participation using the Q&A or chat features of the webinar software. In your Cisco webinar portal, under the tab that says Presentation, and you look at the upper right, you see an icon for chat and an icon for q and If you have questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Leah will keep an eye out for the questions under the Q&A icon. As time permits, we'll read questions for our speakers after the presentation. If technical or logistical problems, we ask that you submit those using the chat function. Please ensure that you're identified either by name or participant ID so that our webinar hosts will be able to help you troubleshoot whatever problem you're having with audio or other issues. With function, you can choose whether you'd like your comment to be visible to all participants or you can choose to send the questions only to the hosts. We need a huge thanks to our hosts, Catherine, Annie, and Lauren Howard at the Most Primary Care Institute. They do amazing work behind the scenes to make the webinars possible. They'll be monitoring the chat functions today to help with any technical troubleshooting. And I'd like to introduce today's two speakers. The first will be Matt Machiski. PhD, a research scientist in the Center for Health Services Research in Primary Care at the Durham VA Medical Center, a professor in the Department of Population Health Sciences at the Duke University Medical Center, and an adjunct professor in the UNC Schools of Public Health and Pharmacy. He has conducted HRQ-funded research on understanding how care is managed and coordinated for patients with multiple chronic conditions in Medicare, Medicaid, and the VA. And he has led VA-funded and NIH-funded evaluations of the health and economic impacts of long-term outcomes of pediatric surgery. The next speaker will be Shoshana Weiner. Shoshana attended medical school at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve and received a Master in Public Health from Case Western Reserve University. She completed her internal, res internal medicine residency training at the Cleveland Clinic moved to Maryland, where she practices as a primary care physician with Mid-Atlantic Permanent Medical Group for two years. She University of Maryland School of Medicine faculty in 2016. She has started her research career investigating chronic kidney disease at the Baltimore VA. Um, thank of our speakers, and I think that we have uh, slides pulled up, and Matt, you can take it away. Great much. I see my slides. A minute ago, and now they my screen as well. To um, share my screen up at the top of the okay. web your screen, I think. Ma maybe it is my screen. Um, should I open my slides? No. Uh, so are you can turn your mouse? I 
So I'd open my slides and walk through them. Part of the. But we have available if you can't get to them, but if you can. Go okay, I will open them. So bear with me as everyone watches me go through my find slides. Okay, let's see. Oh, hopefully everyone can see these slides. Yes. Yep. Great. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present this work today. Um, and I look forward to anyone's feedback. And feel free to um, jump in if you have questions along the way. Um, should I shrink this in some way? Is that good? Did I do something bad? Where I am. Okay. Okay. You still see the slides? <clears throat> I can see them. Okay. Here we go. So I want to acknowledge my collaborators on this work, who are Brett Hamill here at Duke and Kim Lochner at CMS, and also VA HSR and D funding for my research career scientist award. Uh, this work I'm presenting was unfunded otherwise. Um, so as many of you probably know. Multimorbidity is associated with lots of bad things, including uh, health care expenditures in really a health system that you look at. And this slide just simply shows that Medicare, total Medicare expenditures increased dramatically as you go zero to one conditions to up to plus 2015 data. Um, and the average number of medications taken by patients with multimorbidity also increases dramatically. Uh, and this is again focused on, these are adults 21 and older. Um, management of multimorbidity um, is challenging in numerous ways, I think, based on work we've done and uh, kind of with colleagues like Heather and others. Um, patient risk for adverse events, as I'd said, utilization costs increase with the number of conditions. Um, and it may be that management of multimorbidity become the defining challenge of our century now because people multimorbidity are tremendously heterogeneous. I mean, the management of diabetes and hypertension and, and hyperlemia may be very different than the management of cancer, depression, and COPD. So there may not be a single magic bullet or care model that's going to work for everyone equally well. Um, and figure all this out, it requires multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaboration because this to me feels like an incredibly large elephant for which I'm just sort of grant one small part and it's our collective work together we can hopefully identify care models that work across a broad swath of people with multimorbidity but I think we're still quite a ways from that. So present to you today is a, an analysis that addressed two research questions. We wanted to describe the cumulative duration of 19 chronic conditions tracked in Medicare uh, and do this in a cohort and the population of Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries in 2015. And 19 chronic conditions are captured in the chronic condition warehouse that has been set up now for quite some time in Medicare. And cumulative duration is later. And then we also wanted to examine whether variation in total expenditures can be explained better by this new idea of cumulative duration or condition counts that have been around for quite some time now and are reported in really high Medicare. Uh, to improve question to, to improve care of complex patients, I feel like there's got two streams of work to form how we can improve the care of multi patients. The first is to try and develop effective interventions for complex patients. Um, and that may require understanding why are some cares crashing and burning and what is about some care models in smaller single sites or limited sites maybe got care and us um, maybe seeming to work better pace. Um, and you also need to then identify which patients, multimorbid pace, are most likely to be well served by these um, patients or care models. Um, and it may be that given how many patients there are who have morbidity, that some prioritization is going to be needed because not all 
both more morbid patients are going to be well suited for a given intervention, or it's also likely to go in case that cost interventions may not be it may not be possible to provide them to all patients need them, and some kind of prioritization may. Be <laughs> um, and in in terms of the goal of identifying patients likely to be well served by intervention. You know, see from these prior slides that condition counts seem to be an important way of characterizing patients' adverse events that they're likely to have. However, I'm coming, becoming convinced that condition counts is a very important step in trying to characterize who might be worked or who's at greatest risk for adverse events, but complexity is potentially the more relevant construct. And clearly, multimorbidity is a function, is part of complexity, but it's not the whole story. Because maybe people whose care is complex, that is, they are challenging to care for, and they may be at great risk for a adverse events, <clears throat> not because they have six conditions, but maybe because they have, have um, social determinants of health that are. Um, there or knows, I guess I'll say. Um, this so there's a different stream of work that Heather and I are doing on that theme um, to work where we're really trying to extend this idea of complexity in an incremental way with data that we have already. And so I'm going to present today is what I would call a simple approach to go beyond condition counts really by leveraging data that already exists in Medicare claims by constructing cumulative duration of conditions. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I. Um, okay. So that's the simple thing, and I'll define that in a couple slides. The thing is to try to measure complexity in a more multifactorial way. It's the ongoing VA study mentioned is we're in the field now with a large survey to 10,000 veterans and collecting social determinants of health and other factors that may represent more than just multimorbidity. Um, and that determine how that all fleshes out. But really interesting work that Melissa Way at Michigan has done, um, trying to take existing physical function measures and weight them to improve our ability to predict events like mortality or costs um, by doing creative of established, well-validated physical function measures. So if you know about her work, it's really, really interesting and cool stuff. You know, self-reported kind of thing. So what are the potential benefits of going beyond condition counts? Well, I think condition counts may be very incredibly helpful, as the slides at the beginning show. They really do differentiate people on the basis of adverse events. Condition counts and, and their simplicity and their uniformity, because you can construct it off of diagnosis codes in pretty much any health system, um, may be very powerful and simple. Despite being simple, it's powerful. However, going to the second bullet, this uh, impogeneity that's not characterized by patient counts, for example, uh, patients with two conditions might be people with two incidents, or it might be a person with two conditions, that, the same two conditions, but they had them for 10 years. And that those two patients have, because of the duration of the, their exposed to that condition. It may have very different clinical implications for how you would manage them and the modifiability of the risk of events in their underlying condition and how to manage um, with those conditions going forward. Uh, the last bullet is there's also potentially uh, uh, in the high end of the distribution where we're looking at people with six counts and um, you know, talk about this in the prior slide about two conditions existing for a total of two person years if the first person has two incident conditions for 20 person years. But that becomes a lot more extreme when you look at the high end of the distribution of people with six or more conditions. So we've got, say, one patient who's got six incident conditions with six person years of exposure to chronic conditions. And there could be another person who's had them for 10 years each or longer. And that with more conditions that gets lumped into the same category. My, as it says, 100 to 200 person years of outcomes 
for whom management might be extremely different. Um, maybe that that person only have limited life expectancy be much more of a candidate for palliative care than the first person who has six incident conditions. From the, the you might be working just with first line medication. They try to manage conditions or just starting with lifestyle modification, and the person may be well past that point. So, motivation for why we should go beyond condition counts, averaging data in sort of incremental ways that I'm going to talk about here, or look at um, leveraging survey data. Say. So, the incremental work is, is to apply this cumulative duration idea, and I had this idea driving to work one day. The Medicare claims for 20 years now, almost, um, and has the CW data for quite some time, simply to instruct covariates or create a Charleston score for predicting outcomes. But it's known that in the chronic condition warehouse, you identify does which beneficiaries have a condition today or in this year, but there's no data or variables in that data set that indicate the first ever of when there are care claims um, identifying the fishery with each of these 19 conditions. The number of conditions in CCW has since increased to 27. There's 15 other conditions, but we just talking just the 19. And it's possible on the basis of this first ever flag to define, as it starts in January 1st, 1999, um, we can now, with that variable, simply count the number of years that are at each of these 19 conditions, or the duration. And then we can sum all those durations to get at the cumulative duration. That's the very simple idea of it. And as I was having to work one day, I thought, this simple, just like the condition counts are, and has to be predictive of really interesting stuff, and is probably going to unmask all kinds of heterogeneity. So that's what we wanted to do. So we Descriptive statistics of this 1% Medicare population in 2015 we describe uh, the cumulative duration by the typical categories 0 to 1, 2 to 3, 4 to 5, and 6 plus. We basically run some logistic regressions trying to see which predicts total cost better. Condition counts, the usual approach, or cumulative duration. And we do it using both a continuous version of these variables and then kind of into the quartile. So here's the sort of figure, or the strobe figure, indicating that really this is the 100% sample. We excluded folks for a number of reasons. As you can see, you know, Medicare Advantage was kicked out, um, and having A and B and, and other factors. So we have a lot of fun. We started our um, KIC-8. Um, we need to have a couple of years to, um, to rise their conditions at base. So is the prevalence of conditions in 2015, which mirrors the uh, CMS website, right? basically. Um, no surprise, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and arthritis are the most common diagnosed conditions in nervous beneficiaries. Um, and then in the overall cohort of two, 20 million beneficiaries, mean um, Cumulative duration between 1999 and 2015 was people had average 23.6 person years of the 19 chronic conditions, with a minimum of zero because people basically died within the year early on and didn't have diagnoses, up to 200 and almost 17 person years of exposure. And obviously, we know that that have been in Medicare well long before 1999, or might have had these conditions before becoming eligible for Medicare, and so you know, this maximum value is actually, or all the values are really underestimates, likely, but nonetheless, this suggests that there's a lot of heterogeneity, the deviation uh, is equal to mean, so that's always an indication of strong availability. <clears throat> and when we look, break this out by the different subgroups, we can see in people with zero conditions, their mean is 2.6 person use, which makes maybe some sense. And when we jump to the category of people X or more, we jump 
person of exposure to these 19 conditions. And the maximums increase a lot, as you would expect. Um, I think that's what I'll say about this. And then we thought, I thought for sure cumulative duration would be way more predictive total Medicare expenditures and um, conditions, but it was not. I was shocked by this finding, I must say. Um, and so no matter what, whether we measure these things as counts, or continuous variables, or quartiles, can counts are vastly more predictive. Um, and so maybe, you know, total expenditures is not uh, an outcome in which this is going to be informative. There may be other outcomes that are more that that limit of duration would be more predictive of. Um, but none, and there are other limitations that I should note that the, the we didn't have consistent look back periods. From 2015 for defining conditions, that's the way CCW does it. Um, so those here, here. Um, and the, another thing about this is that some conditions are really persistent once they become incident and are, require ongoing clinical management and self-management, but others less so. Some others, like tendon stroke, may be episodic. If you had a stroke years ago or depression 12 years ago, you don't necessarily have it today, and it's not necessarily worse than it was 12 years ago. With diabetes and hypertension, those that are still going to be ongoing, but you had some, say, dark surgery or something. Um, and so the, so the counts treat all these conditions the same, and there's probably a need to weight them in some way, and that's subject for future work. So in conclusion, we found that there's significant variation in cumulative duration. Um, and it's especially true as condition counts increase, as you can see by this table. <clears throat> uh, the range between the min and the max, and then a deviation basically right, increases markedly as you go up in number of cons. Condition counts were more predictive of medic total Medicare expenditures than cumulative duration. Um, and then lastly, going back to the big picture, I think we need to identify complex patients whose outcomes are modifiable by new care models. Uh, maybe cumulative duration is a useful tool, it is useful for, say, risk adjustment or something, and expenditures, as I might have hoped, uh, can be a really descriptive thing to tease, about, tease apart some of the heterogeneity that you get at through um, some counts. Uh, and lastly, this is an incremental way of uh, trying to plug under the same lamppost and redo a condition count analysis, but to move measurement incrementally forward, hopefully some useful way, but um, not to. So very much, and happy questions. Thank you. That was um, great work. Um, and actually have a uh, question and in the meantime, um, I'll see if um, Shoshana wants to start um, getting slides ready to go. But but my question would be, is the, is one potential issue with the with the cumulative um, duration of conditions the fact that for some conditions it may be just a linear relationship that the worse you have it, sort of regressed and gotten worse. But for other things, I can imagine that almost having it for a long time. Actually, um, either mean that you've grown accustomed to it, or <laughs> you've um, it, it, it's, it's become relatively rel relatively well controlled, or that there may be sort of a survivor effect going on where when you're looking at something that people have had for a long time, even those people that are that are tolerating it fairly well. I think those are that's a really good point. I mean, I know in in the Charleston score, I think, and maybe the and certainly the Gagne score, hypertension is a, not a predictor of mortality in the Gagne score because apparently it's awfully well controlled in a lot of patients. Uh, so, and and this measure does not consider medication management or well controlled these conditions are, and the server effects. So, so in a way, what in a way for a number of reasons. This measure of cumulative duration is endogenous for a number of reasons, and I think that's totally legitimate and a real criticism. Thank you. 
you say specifically was um, how was how was uh, kidney disease uh, among these 19 is disease one of um, is it is it counted just as one one wing with chronic kidney disease? That's right. And we don't stage it. We don't. No, there's no staging to any of these conditions either. Right. 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 So speaking of chronic kidney disease, I know that that's going to be the topic of um, Shana Weiner's um, talk. And um, Shana, um, do you want you to get your slides up? Oh, looks like there. They are. And it does. We have one question from a participant. They ask, okay. "Is hypertension protective?" Um, certainly, if it, it's probably the case that it could be. You know, we didn't disentangle the we didn't look at the duration effects of each condition to see if there was nerdy in it or no association, and that might be a logical thing to do. So. And I think um, so. For uh, people who want to call, um, I do uh, encourage you if you weren't here for the beginning announcement. Uh, lines are muted, but please um, do feel free to submit questions for either of our speakers um, using the Q and A function. Um, and with that, uh, Shoshana, I'll, I'll let I'll let you take it away. Great. Um, um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Good. That sounds good. Thanks, sir. Um, so for my pilot project, I looked, started to look at um, comorbidity indices as well, and for uh, two comorbidity indices, um, how they may play a role in understanding the risk of death or end stage renal disease in an elderly population. Um, so, first, I'm going to start with some definitions. Um, so, acute kidney injury is, has is, been sort of a difficult thing to um, find exactly. Um, it's an abrupt change in kidney function, usually over a short period of time. And at this current state in clinical practice, this is by changes in creatinine, um, GFR, and also um, urinary output. Um, Cadao, which is Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, is an international organization that. Uh, kind of produces guidelines on kidney disease care, um, came up with these criteria of how severe um, AKI is and how to uh, find AKI. Um, there's been three studies, and um, they're based on how big vitreous and creatinine at baseline or the need for renal replacement therapy. Your is usually only looked at in ICU settings because it's just not followed, unfortunately, very well in the hospital. Um, this has been controversial is in stage one and increases 0 0.3 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, it really probably isn't considered a huge increase, particularly as you go to further stages of chronic kidney disease. Um, then creating just to say a logarithmic scale. So as you go up in creatinine, the changes don't mean as much as they do in lower um, stage kidney disease. Uh, the canal acute kidney injury is that the incidence is really been increasing uh, internally. So this, was, um, this was a study done in Medicare beneficiaries, and um, just different, you know, for age race. Um, the years there's been more AKI defined. Um, in addition to AKI becoming more prevalent, chronic kidney disease is becoming more prevalent as well. Chronic kidney disease is defined by um, the glomerular, glomerular filtration rate. Um, so on this column here, and then also um, some concerns or uh, some based on the amount of protein in the urine, which has been a concern in a lot of studies because it's just always available. We don't always have the amount of protein in the urine. Um, there's been that has been recognized between acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. So the factors for both of these are comorbidities, age, there's a lot of things that happen through acute kidney injury episodes. So to see how severe the acute kidney is based on those criteria, we, I, I had a first slide. 
the same chronic kidney disease. Um, how thin these episodes happening, the proteinuria we had talked about, and also how long people have chronic kidney disease or acute kidney injury for um, while they have their episode. And these events in chronic kidney disease itself has been associated with cardiovascular events and same disease requiring dialysis um, or a quality of life. So trying to understand how to prevent these issues in old elderly adults would be important, and there's lots of efforts being put into how we can start to test. Um, and just as these are just um, just a kind of ready to see where we're at now. Um, this meta-analysis that was looking at um, both um, AKI versus non-AKI risks of developing end-stage renal disease, chronic kidney disease, and also mortality. So the first graph is um, the risk of chronic kidney disease, and the second is end-stage renal disease. And there's great heterogeneity um, in this data. Um, in general, there is overall felt to be a risk if you had AKI of developing um, these, these kidney outcomes. A um, pooled hazard ratio of the top chart was 8.8, .8, and for um, end-stage renal disease in the bottom, it was 3.1. As far as um, this has also been looked at in many studies, and um, the hazard ratio was 1.6, or kind of being one that kind of had a very large um, hazard ratio. So as far as elderly, we're starting to think more specifically. There has been some studies, and um, I just wanted to show just to show how um, the probability of end stage renal disease goes up um, with events of AK um, at having. CKD uh, tends to make this risk worse. So if you have baseline kidney dysfunction, having an acute problem um, can make you of having end-stage renal disease. Uh, a study in 2,000 Medicare patients who were over 67, and it was over two years. And these patients had AKI in the hospital in one year, near 2,000. Um, to kind of start kind of the concerns or questions that are being brought up about this topic, I just wanted to um, kind of bring up one of the, a little bit of an older study, um, where they said, this is a Geisinger um, Medical Center study, um, which is in central Pennsylvania, and they looked at patients with reversible kidney injury. So this isn't even just kidney injury that, that cuts it after being out of the hospital, but the creatinine uh, returns to normal. And um, they were studied over three to four years. Uh, on the left, you can see the unadjusted, um, the unadjusted analysis of, of developed mortality. So the AI population in general seems to have more mortality, and they certainly have more incidence of, of chronic kidney disease. Um, in this study, all patients had a normal kidney function at baseline, and chronic kidney disease was. Um, was as a GFR under 60, which is that stage three chronic kidney disease. What they looked at is when they adjusted for the no chronic kidney disease in these patients, that relationship of an AKI event and mortality disappeared. Seen here on this top one where they um, look at the incidence. So if you look at a column where there's no AKI versus AKI in patients that don't have baseline chronic kidney disease, the um, rate of mortality is much lower than in patients who had chronic kidney disease. The bumper were um, additional cost proportional hazards, where they looked at mortality, looking at specific variables that could be, that they could impact this population. And as you can see, um, you know, that were considered to be uh, um, at least statistically significant. The Comer index, which they did look at in this study, they did a very small um, they looked at a, a, a small increase in comorbidity. So as we just saw, you know, these elderly have tons and tons of comorbidities. And so the idea of just looking at two versus zero or one um, doesn't really, wouldn't really show the true risk maybe of comorbidity and death. Um, as a sort of concern of chronic kidney disease being such a, uh, of, of uh, going on, they did look at risks for chronic kidney disease as well in this population. And they had age, um, um, the age of um, how severe the AKI was 
and so the comorbidities were kind of were predictive of whether chronic kidney disease uh, developed or not, and then incidentally the, the concern of what people done or not. I just brought up kind of a um, I like to just read it. My list. Oh, here we go. Um, brings up a concern, particularly in the elderly, as to whether AKI is really causing more kidney disease and in return is causing more, more mortality, or is it just AKI that's um, leading to these outcomes? Um, and the concern is that these patients with AKI, maybe it's not actually the event itself that's causing the issue, but that patients have a lot of comorbidity to start with, and they're at risk for AKI and incidentally are having AKI. So it's a little bit chicken or egg question, particularly in elderly, being um, explored and thought of. Um, so in this pilot project, one of the um, that I looked at were two comorbidity indices, which I'm trying to figure out. I don't know why this isn't dancing. Um, oh, um, so the two, uh, what we had talked about is the Charleston comorbidity index. And um, as we talked about, there's 19 different variables. There was that was um, sort of put in with ICD-9 codes that um, called the Dave Carlson comorbidity index. And part of the reason we did this is we just we to be blunt fast code for it, so it made it easier to do. The um, only difference between the regular uh, Carlson that I wanted to bring up was that all of the new cancer indices were put into one, the metastatic cancer, so it made it into 17 variables instead of 19. So not quite as specific as the original Carlson comorbidity index. And so looked at what they call the new comorbidity index, and this was developed in the United States incident dialysis population in 2000. Um, and what they did is it performed better in predicting mortality in patients who had just started dialysis. The population is different. Um, my feeling of this index is, first of all, it's easier to use, and that they're um, I focus more on comorbidities that specifically affect kidney function. Um, the fact that it's developed in a kidney population uh, who's kind of reaching end stage renal disease. Um, in this pilot project, I looked at, um, I compared the new comorbidity index to the Charleston in an elderly population after an inpatient AKI event. And then I wanted to compare how they, um, um, the utility, and then how they performed compared to each other. And then I looked at comorbidities as part of predicting end stage renal disease. Which, um, I find in this cohort as a GFR under 15. Um, so, what, so this is my population, which is on the next slide. Sorry, I'm having trouble here. Um, there's a very large national database at the VA. Um, so, I actually looked at patients who had an AKI inpatient region. Um, Sometimes these are defined purely by creatinine. And if we didn't do that, there was actually a lot of variability with very messy data. So um, it was going to be very hard to truly uh, decide who was having AKI and not based on their creatinine. Um, we were also missing some variables as far as brace, so we couldn't measure GFR as well. And so um, we took for women, the women have um, a lower creatinine um, for GFR based on the calculations that we use for GFR. So um, I originally patients who had essentially normal renal function for the elderly or closer to um, normal renal function and um, to all the admissions for AKI between 2005 and 2010. And so these were excluded on stable um, labs. And um, there's, as I said, just a lot of variability. And this was six months before admission. So it was pretty surprising to see so much variability and how sick this population is at the VA. Um, Exclude bias value, thinking that there may be a pre admission um, creatinine, which led to their admission, um, but um, still kind of associated with their admission for AKI. And then um, we also, I looked just at people being admitted to a general medicine service. Um, only 267 of these patients had hemodialysis during their admission. I excluded them for being kind of a separate population. And then the patients that died. Um, so the goal is to look at patients with an AI event with relatively good, um, good functions that were mid AKI, and so that left 16,403. So it's in a varied analysis. So um, for the first um, goal is to look at death at one year. Um,
as far as univariate analysis. Um, patients so, um, who died, which is not surprising, they had a longer length of stay. And um, interestingly, um, renal indices weren't really that different. So statistically, or I guess statistically, there was a difference between baseline creatinine and GFR. Um, but clearly, um, there wasn't much of a difference between these, between these, especially also in the severity, AKI severity, which has been shown to be a risk of mortality. I also looked at AKI as a primary diagnosis. Um, um, and with GFR over 90, but um, I split the GFR um, calculation based on, for all under 60, would be considered stage 3 CKD. There's some um, data in the elderly, and we discussed the elderly as to how accurate GFR calculations are. And the issue is the elderly um, tend to have a lower muscle mass. Um, now, so, you know, frequently if patients are sicker, um, they may have a low creatinine because they don't have a lot of muscle mass. So there's some issues with measuring creatinine that are being studied using Chinese other markers of kidney function, which eventually in the, in the future of medicine might be very helpful, but um, right now, in the clinical world, we don't have a whole lot of opportunity um, to use these uh, other variables like cystatin and other things that may, may be associated with muscle mass. So it's interesting that a lot of this, a good amount of this population actually had a GFR that was above 90, which would be a very high renal function um, for someone who's elderly. So um, we'll get to this later, but my concern is that uh, patients presenting with a higher GFR will actually may be having the reasons um, why their mortality is higher other than low kidney function. When we look at scores, um, it was just one of the things that, um, I'm sorry, I didn't go. When we look at morbidity scores, um, there were some findings that were, that, you know, we want to go back and maybe try to explore a little bit better, but in general, congestive heart failures, cerebrovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, cancer, Dysemia, COPD, and liver disease were, um, were more than in the people that died at one year. What was strange is that diabetes and um, coronary artery disease were really more common in the patients that lived. And I don't know if it was people weren't um, recognized as being diabetic or for some reason the treatment and the AKI, somehow these patients do better. Um, I don't know why that would be. Um, it was consistent using both um, comorbidity indices and something for us to figure out in the data. Um, general patients that did uh, had a higher comorbidity index, which you would expect, um, and it's a little bit unclear as to why those specific um, to comorbidities would be uh, more than the people that lived at one year. If anyone has any insight that maybe they're followed more often, maybe they get more care specifically for those um, for those problems. Um, and other comorbidities. Um, this is the myo curves at one year based on the comorbidity index score, and not surprisingly, um, there was a, a um, relationship of the higher the comorbidity index was, the higher um, the, the often patients experience mortality. Um, on the left is the Charleston, um, and then the right is the um, new comorbidity index. Um, and basically, the strata were based on clinical significance and mainly kind of not two quartiles, but sort of how, you know, the data did out since um, it was fully distributed, and I didn't think it, it wouldn't have been statistically correct to use a straight score. Um, for the proportional hazard models in this, um, there was a dose-dependent relationship between increasing comorbidity index and um, risk for death. Uh, kind of interestingly, there may have been a small impact on acute AKI severity, which has been found in other data. Um, some of this may have to do with um, some lack of significance, may have to do with a smaller population of severe uh, severity of three. Um, but um, the, the impact is, is certainly more than what's been seen in other studies. Um, like say, it was surprisingly related to mortality. And um, as far as the GFR relationship that we were talking about, that was sort of interesting. 
is a, um, sort of a UJ-shaped relationship. So for patients that have GFR between 60 and 90, um, with no difference in mortality risk, for patients who had a higher GFR, there was an increase in mortality. This for both models, um, you know, meaning that you know, there's certainly variables, unfortunately, um, that we were able to look at that we want to look at in the future or um, just really aren't available this data. So proteinuria, as we discussed, is a um, big problem in VA data because they frequently aren't able to get, they're just in the data available in the data set. Um, and it's in um, this, this, uh, the amount of robbery. Um, the, there's a lot of variability, again, in the data with cranes that were available um, after discharge, but um, in the future we want to do a sensitivity analysis looking at um, in all population. So as far as for the, the risk death, um, there was a dose-dependent increase with comorbid burden. Um, there may be some relationship with the severity of AKI, but um, at least in this data, it wasn't as strong as what has been seen in our population, uh, maybe due to the fact that we're controlling for comorbidity better, or maybe because of the older population, maybe that there's more of a relationship in younger patients. Um, and then um, patients with a higher GFR may actually have a uh, higher risk of death, maybe due to um, other uh, issues with their with their health, such as frailty, sarcopenia, um, and their studies when they can't probe near, I have looked at serum albumin, um, which um, we're um, hoping to go back and add that in to see, and that may be a marker of some of these other um, that are going on with these patients. Um, two comorbidity indices were performed pretty equally. An initial analysis, which I'm not showing today, um, did do a standardized a standardization of the comorbidity indices to be able to compare them better, and there was really no difference in the these statistics. Um, so the yeah, idea perhaps a simpler comorbidity index may be easier to use, although didn't really perform too much better than the Charleston comorbidity index. So um, and it's easier to use, it may be worthwhile thinking about. Um, for the analysis, we did competing risk to look at uh, the outcome of end-stage renal disease. Our competing risk, um, just to kind of describe that, um, it's possible that two either completely independent events can happen or that two related events may happen. And the concern is that um, one, of the, one of the outcomes could prevent another outcome from happening. So, for example, in our study, the primary um, event we're looking at is CKD progression, which in this case I, I was looking at stage renal disease, but it, you have to be able to live to develop end stage renal disease. Um, the in one year was very low with 0.6%, which is similar um, to other studies in this population where um, even patients in general outcome in one year is, isn't um, super prevalent and so our incident. So um, in order to do this analysis, I, I matched it on gender, region, and admission year um, in order to come up with a cohort. Um, which is, which is um, so here's our analysis um, for the NBH renal disease. Um, um, and the folds actually were older, which um, is, is because if you are going, if you, you have to live again to be able to develop end stage renal disease, um, the length of stay um, didn't, wasn't longer, but um, I, as we go to the model, I didn't put in the model because it didn't really change um, the, the prediction um, the prediction in, in the model. Um, in those disease, more severe AKI, of course, in this situation, um, was there amongst people who developed end stage renal disease versus the controls. And the AKI as the primary diagnosis was more common in people who reached end stage renal disease. And um, what's interesting too to look at is the competing risk and really was a very high death rate in both populations. So in general, it was a very sick population where mortality is just much more concerned potentially than even um, getting end stage renal disease or even earlier stages of CKD uh, and the control not surprising, had a higher mortality. Um, there really wasn't a huge difference as far as baseline renal function um, at the beginning of before the AI um, event. Um, as far as the 
indices are concerned, um, can try to higher incidence of care and COPD, um, which is sort of saying that, um, you know, perhaps patients, you know, have end stage renal disease don't perhaps have that um, herbicity is often, uh, although um, it's interesting to go back and kind of understand um, some more busy, uh, distribution better, which we, we hope to do. Um, and as far as the amount, uh, so, um, so the cumulative, like we've been talking about, the actual amount of comorbidities per person was similar. And here, diabetes a little bit, a little bit more sense, although it wasn't different between populations. But um, at least the people who developed end stage renal disease didn't have a lower threshold. But it's just, you know, this kind of showing how complex the relationship is between all these different comorbidities and whether someone is going to develop end stage renal disease or even mortality um, in this population, which is part of what um, the studies said have been very variable, what they look at, how they look at it, um, and it's a very complex uh, relationship. Um, looking at the incidence curves, um, this, this, uh, it, the this in the curves was not statistically significant, but interestingly, people with a low comorbidity index did tend to have more of an incidence of end stage disease, which makes sense because if you're, you have to be able to live in order to develop end stage renal disease. Um, so this with a competing risk model for the fine gray model is direct hazard ratios, so you can't look at them the same way as direct risk like you can with the Cox proportional hazard. Um, surprisingly, it can't primary diagnosis and um, at least stage, stage, stage 3 study for AKI was related with developing um, end stage renal disease. Um, what, what I hope to sort of out and think about how to look at this later and, oh, and also younger age again, because if you um, or you have to be able to live in order to develop end stage renal disease. Uh, although the comorbidity indice scores were not significant, in this case, I don't use the new morbidity index, um, there is at least a, one could do a potential trend um, towards actually having a lower um, comorbidity score, which may be in a bigger, um, the uh, patient is small in this analysis, so that may not be good enough to detect this. But um, the concern would be when we started thinking that early, they get admitted to the hospital with acute kidney injury, is if they do have a low comorbidity index, and having a very severe AKI event, maybe patients in particular that we may be thinking about more how to get our kidney function um, stabilized and look out outcomes since, um, you know, we are only getting stuck on dialysis, which is happening more often now. Um, as far as this uh, analysis was concerned, so patients with more severe AKI, um, their primary diagnosis of kidney failure. Um, had increased risk, which is consistent with our um, studies that have been done. Um, and you know, this high mortality rate makes it very hard to kind of find this relationship and see. Um, some studies have handled this by actually only looking at patients. Um, the recent study um, done actually only at patients that lived for the year and compare that to people with end-stage renal disease. But especially in the elderly, that would be very biased since um, if you look at the risks and, and in that population, you're not really understanding how likely it is for someone to get end stage renal disease. Um, basically, when you're seeing a patient in the hospital, you can't predict is this person going to die or not die. So, we want to try to come up with the abilities to predict um, outcomes at the time of treatment and not introspect, you know, that. Um, younger patients had increased risk, which, which also makes sense. Um, and so, the next step. Um, which some of these things brought in. We want to look at other um, labs and factors that could contribute to any renal disease. Um, look at renal worker data in the, in the data that we have for that. Um, probably look at this issue with diabetes being less common in patients that uh, die one year. So maybe looking at sugars or A1Cs or medications for misdiagnosis codes. Um, locations who are admitted to other parts of the hospital. And um, also compare patients that do and don't start being a replacement therapy, which is a topic in the elderly since, um, and that's another line of research looking at uh, who would truly benefit from starting being a replacement therapy in the elderly since, as we just saw, the mortality is so high. Uh, it 
Young Thanks to my funding source, which was the Aging Initiative Project. Um, my collaborators and mentors, um, Dr. Fink at the University of Maryland is a nephrologist here. Dr. Kessel is a pediatrician at both is from our VA. Um, Dr. Smith is over at Kaiser Permanente, and he helped me with developing my project and the data analysis. Um, Dr. Sun and Dr. Zan are the statisticians that helped me. Dr. Stewart is amazing with uh, large data sets, as is Tariq Siddiqui. Share my screen. Thank you, Shana, for for interesting presentation. I like to open up both speakers to questions. Um, please answer questions using the Q and A function at the bottom right hand side of your screen. And thanks, Shoshana, I'll start with a question of my own um, related to your findings. That's sort of surprising about the diabetes. I'm wondering. In your models, did you look at the number of outpatient visits? Just thinking if someone has a diabetes diagnosis, they are likely to be receiving fairly intensive care to hopefully control that condition. In your models, did you look at number of their health care utilization in any way? I maybe looked at that with number of creatinines, and there were a lot of patients that only had, um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the number, they only had one creatinine in the six months before admission. And so the patients you're right, might have a lower chance of that. Um, we did use the comorbidities that were entered in for the admission. So it kind of would be surprising if someone was admission, admitted with diabetes that that wouldn't have ended up as part of their ICD-9 codes. Um, so it was a little strange, but that, that would be something to look at um, as, as far as utilization. That, that would be good to think about. I didn't actually look at as far as so that would be something to think about too. Yeah, and the HCRN has a virtual data warehouse, um, so VDU data source if they might have um, mm -hmm. different available or, or high labs available there. Sure. The question they'd like to ask. Meant to ask you, I, I was wondering if you, if you did any, you know, you're comparing the counts versus the duration to predict cost. Did you look for any action between those two terms? And if you combine them somehow, if they could be more to that predicting? Interesting. We hadn't considered interacting them, but that would certainly be something to consider. Um, I was looking at this analysis as kind of a proof of concept and was maybe supported, but great. Yeah. We have a question from a participant um, for looking into disease duration. Had you had any thoughts on how to get at disease severity to explain disease complexity? The short is lab data. Um, one thing we'd like to do, medication use another. Um, that's complicated, but short answer. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Have follow-up questions, or maybe we can give everyone the gift of time. I just wanted to thank both of you again, Matt and Shoshana, for your excellent presentations and taking the time here to um, said our Aging Initiative webinar. If anyone has any questions about the Aging Initiative or about today's webinar, there's some uh, email addresses for Catherine and Lauren on your screen. Uh, please contact them. Thank you to everyone who attended, and we hope you'll join us at our next webinar.